I'm Randall Kaplan, and I have an awesome guest today, my good friend, Bobby Ryan. Bobby is a professional hockey player who's about to start his 15th season in the NHL. It's his first season with my hometown, Detroit Red Wings. And in honor of him, I'm wearing my Wings jersey from the last championship game from the whole team, signed by the whole team. There's five Hall of Famers on that team, including Steve Eiserman, the new general manager of the Red Wings. Bobby and I met four years ago in Coeur d'Alene. We both have summer homes there and we live across the street from one another there. Bobby, thanks for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. You have an incredibly unique life to get to where you are today. It's a truly remarkable struggle and inspirational story about talent, family, mistakes, loyalty, struggles, hard work, focus, and best of all, redemption. And I want to start today by talking about your childhood, your family life, and your journey to becoming an NHL All-Star. It's a story that I think many people don't know about, and I'd love to start from the beginning. Where were you born and where did you live and what kind of kid were you? I was, uh, I was born in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, so Southern Jersey, um, just across from Philadelphia. And, um, you know, through my life, I've kind of lived everywhere and we'll get through all that, I guess. But uh, by way of California, Michigan, uh, Northern Ontario, Canada, um, you know, into into Anaheim, Ottawa, and now Detroit. So a little bit everywhere. Uh, and I was uh, I was just an athletic, you know, I was a single single child. So uh, my parents had a lot of time to invest in me, but I was an athletic kid that played nothing but hockey and um a very studious kid early on so uh, i was good in school got good grades and you know small catholic school upbringing until i was homeschooled later on in life so um you know in a nutshell i guess i'm a mixed bag of where i'm from but i call idaho home now uh, primarily and uh and uh, yeah that you know wherever hockey takes me in the winter excellent what what were your parents like when you were younger my dad, uh, my dad's kind of, you know, a dying breed. I think uh, he's, he was hard. Uh, you know, he built a business from the ground up and became pretty successful and did a good job of things. But, uh, you know, he's very, I, I almost want to say militaristic with what, with what works for him, right? He's, you know, he's in his early 60s now and it's still about diet and and working out and fitness and all those things and he's very militaristic in his approach so that kind of rubbed off on me and that's how I was up you know brought up um you know 100% kind of focused on task at hand type guy uh, so that's that's how I I am in a lot of ways you had a normal childhood uh for for a, a while and then when you turned 10 years old what happened so, uh, you know, the, the story is pretty out there, but, uh, you know, my, my mom and dad had a, 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 an altercation that really had been coming for years that, you know, became the, the big, the big night and defining moment of my childhood where, uh, you know, my dad made a lot of mistakes that night and, and, um, you know, we all suffered the consequences, but he, uh, he went off the handle and, and got physical with my mom. Uh, I slept right through, and that was the first time I actually have ever slept through one of those. There were there were smaller ones, but nothing of this scale. Um, so you know, I woke up at my grandparents' house the next day and still had no clue. My mom was in the hospital. My dad was on the run. So it was a it was a big night. Um, you know, a, a night that uh, you know I was ten, uh, so I didn't know I didn't know it was coming, but I felt like something was always brewing, and and this was the this was the big night. It was a you know a night that. I'll never remember, but I'll never forget if that makes any sense. Right. It it does. Your dad had been at a bar. He came home very drunk, and then he became violent with your mom. He yeah, it landed your mom in the hospital, four broken ribs, and your dad is charged with a number of felonies, including attempted murder. And you're 10, 10 years old, and as you said, your your life has now changed. What what happens? then uh your father is in prison he he makes bail i post bail i think his bail was seventy five thousand dollars and then what happens yeah so there's this kind of long lull in, in between where i hadn't seen any of my family but mom got out of the hospital and came and lived with her grand her parents excuse me and and i stayed there uh my dad had obviously turned himself in and about a year, you know, it wasn't a year. It was it was a short period of time that he was 
behind bars before he posted bail. So we were in limbo, um, a major limbo, I guess. But when he had posted bail, he ran and and uh, decided to kind of flee and, and find a place where we could go, uh, all of us. And that was my parents' decision that all three of us would go somewhere. So he was out on the run under an assumed name. Uh, and we were in limbo just waiting, living at my grandparents, playing hockey, you go in the school, all the things you do. Um, but we were doing them with the knowledge that we were leaving very shortly. And it took about a year for all of that to unfold before we eventually took off. Your dad had been in prison for some amount of time. You're 10 years old. Did you go visit him in prison? And, and what was that like? At that time, no. Um, we weren't sure how long he was going to be there. And I don't think my parents wanted to make it a, a, a thing that they were seeing each other still talking kind of thing. Uh, so there was no real direct communication. Um, and he wasn't, he wasn't gone too long. I, I, I wish I knew exactly, but I feel like it was a matter of months that he was behind bars. I remember seeing him when he got out uh, one time at my other grandparents' house. Um, and he said he was going to be going away and he did. And then that was kind of when he went on the lam. So that was back in the old burner phone days when I would come out of school and we would talk for five minutes every three, four days. Tell me where he was looking at hockey teams so that I could go there and play. And, um, and then we would move on to the next location and we would do that. So I was in New Jersey just waiting to go somewhere all this time. At some point, your parents made up. They went together. You all made this plan. And so what happened? You're around sitting at night, the three of you at a dinner table and your dad says all right i'm gonna run and i want you to join me later once i get set up somewhere yeah the i think for me i was so young that it was just assumed that you know we were going with them but uh we weren't going right away he told me he was going to go find a place to live somewhere that we could hide um where he could secure all the documents to change our names and all that kind of stuff and and be off the grid but somewhere that i could play so um, for me, I, I was so young that I looked at it like an adventure. I didn't know how life changing it was. I really had no clue. I just knew that we were going to be going away for some time. I always thought we'd be back in New Jersey within a year or two. I just, uh, I really had no clue what, what was coming down the line for us and over the next couple of years. And, uh, so you, you drove across country, I read to Washington DC, and then eventually you settled in El Segundo, California, right in my neck of the woods. And I think your dad had lived there before yeah. you all went there for a few months. So why El Segundo? So we actually, El Segundo is where we finished. We ended up first in Redondo, um, living above the old chart house there. And I think the chart house is still there, actually. I went and saw it when I was back living there with the ducks. But uh, it is. he found a place that um, I think everybody thought we would go to Michigan, Minnesota, those hockey states. Um, he went there on a whim and found two Canadian coaches um, and a Russian coach that seemed to be a little bit above their time. So that fit the narrative that we could hide. Um, California wasn't a hockey hotspot. Um, he could he could play professional poker uh, and make his living that way and kind of hide there. And there was no, you know, work stuff to to overcome. And uh, and ultimately the weather the weather helped convince them. So um, all those things kind of factored into that decision. And I was surprised when he did say where we were going, but uh, it ended up being the move of a lifetime for us. When he was looking at places to go, and he's in Southern California talking to the hockey people, did people know who he was? Did he tell people I have a secret? Don't tell. Or he just by that point had a had a new name. Uh, no, when we. When he went, he had just saw the hockey team was being put together, and it was the first AAA team in the state. Uh, so it was the highest level of hockey they were ever going to have. He basically said, listen, I have a kid from the East Coast, my son, that I promise you just watch him once. I'll make your team. Um, so I flew out. I tried out in a men's pickup game with, you know, guys that are 30 and 40 years old. And the coach said right away, we have a spot for him. Bring him back. Um, so that, you know, fast forward a couple months, we get back out there and, Nobody knew the secret. You know, my my original last name was Stevenson, and now it was Ryan. Um, so we did that. We switched my birth date. Um, the problem was not in the ice hockey world, but in the roller hockey world. I, I was arguably one of the better players in the country, and uh, they knew me from roller hockey. And there were pictures in magazines of me, and, you know, talking the next big thing in roller hockey and all that. And uh, um, that 
was when I had, that was the first time like we had to lie, you know, I had to lie just straight up to say, no, I'm not so-and-so when it clearly was me in these pictures and people, it's amazing when you, when you stick to something, how, and, and you're resolute with it, how, how much people let go and just not push. Um, it became a one-time conversation with a lot of people. And although I, would, I think people knew nobody ever pressed the issue. It was just, okay, you're not so-and-so. Um, even though I'm wearing the same gear as that picture from a year and a half ago, uh, it, it, it all just kind of went away. Nobody bothered us about it. Right. I, I heard that, uh, it wasn't uncommon for you to look out the window and look and see if there were maybe undercover police officers Were were you always wondering when that day was going to come where the, the secret would be out? Yeah, I think, uh, we dealt with that because we were left behind my mom and I in New Jersey um, that, you know, they were foreclosing on the houses that my dad had owned and the properties and, and things like that, that people assumed because we weren't paying these bills, we were going to be meeting my dad eventually. And we dealt with a lot of that. We dealt with a lot of, and, and there were people following us all the time. Um, I would never understand it, but mom would just say, put your head down. So I would sit in the front seat with my head down or whatever it might be, or I would be taking a license plate down for my mom uh, of who's following us. And, and it, it didn't dawn on me that people were putting so much together, but we left at, you know, two o'clock in the morning one night, met my dad in DC and drove across the country together in our little van. Um, but we got, it's, it's funny, I got quite used to living that, that lie and that lifestyle before I had even gotten to California, that it felt like a very easy transition when I got there at 11, 12 years old. Was it, was part of it fun? I mean, you're, you're an actor, right? You're as yeah. you 11, 12 years old and you're, you're living a somewhat normal life. You're, you're homeschooled though. You're not in school. I assume that was to keep the secret, but are, is part of it fun? Are you all sitting around the dinner table thinking, all right, we're all cool now. Things are, things are fine. Yeah. I don't think I knew any better. Right. I, I know. I know. I didn't know any better. I knew that I knew what we were doing was wrong. Um, for sure. But at 11 years old, not only are you doing what your parents tell you, uh, it, it felt like a big game to me. <laughs> and you love your parents, right? You, you have a family, you want to be together, obviously. So, and it's your parents' job to raise you, to protect you. Oh, I, yeah. I had fun. So at, at this point, uh, you found the Los Angeles Kings junior program and you thrived. How, how did the junior program come about? That was the team that my dad had set the tryout with. So I, I got there and within two days, I was meeting my teammates and playing a game. Um, and this program had been around, I think, for a year or two, but had marginal success. But this was the first group of 1987 born my birth year um players that they were going to be able to have and for whatever reason that birth year thrived in california for hockey um we had some great hockey players and we had to play we were so good for our age that we had to play up and uh you know we're playing against 16 and 17 year olds getting our butts beat on on the weekends but then we're playing teams like michigan you know detroit honey baked and such and such the, the elite teams and, and we're beating them by five six points in our own bracket so my first year there, we went 39 and 0 and won the national championship. And it was the first time in Southern California that had happened. And uh, I thrived in that program because of the guys around me, the kids around me were, were just tremendous hockey players. So uh, I got very lucky that that was the situation because I don't know if that would have been the case had we picked another place to live. And at this point, you're 12 years old? Yeah, we, we, it was 99, 2000 hockey season. So we won, yeah, I was 12, yes. Yeah, Pee Wee Triple A. And you're beating 16 year olds at this point. Well, the 16 year olds are kicking our butts uh, because they played, you know, the, the local California teams that were a little bit older, they, they'd kick our butts, but then we would go play our age. Uh, and, and we were much more physical from playing against the 16 year olds that we, we ran teams right out of the building. And uh, 2000 was also an important year because one morning people showed up at the door. What was that like? And, and what happened? Did they knock and say, hey, is somebody somebody home? Yeah, no, there was no knock. Uh, there was no knock. It was four o'clock. It was give or take four o'clock in the morning when they came, and they came in strong with all with you know the U.S. Marshals and 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 um, batted down to um, you know armed and and 
I think that they, and I know this now that they thought that they were going in for a guy that was going to fight and be armed and, and all this. And when they got in, they found a 12 year old sleeping on a futon and a pullout couch, right? They, I think they were a little surprised, but my dad obviously surrendered because I was in the crosshairs of everything and went peacefully, but it was, it, they, it's a, it's a weird thing. I've said it in the past. They treated us with respect, even though they're taking away a criminal and, um, the problem was they they knew that they were going in for a guy that had been convicted of attempted murder when it was a Trump that that charge was a little more aggressive than than it needed to be. Right. So he has a five year sentence. He gets extradited to New Jersey, and now he's at Riverfront State Prison. You're playing hockey in L.A. Did you have a chance to go visit your dad when he was in prison? I think I eventually I got back a couple of times, but we stayed put in California. Um, think things were going too well. That that same year was the year that we had won later on. So he went away in January. We won in April. Um, I was so comfortable in California with our new life, really, um, that I don't think we wanted to mess with that. Our team was just so good. Excuse me, there was no point to leave. Um, my mom wanted to go back a little bit, but I, I convinced her to stay. So we ended up staying three more years there and uh, won another national championship with the same group of guys. Got it. And w when he was in prison, did you talk to him by phone regularly? Are you, they allowed to use the phone every day? Most of our communication at that point was by letters and phone calls. Um, we stayed for another three years in, in California and didn't have the financial resources to get back to Jersey and then come back. It just wasn't feasible. Um, you know, mom was working two jobs. I was working as well at 13 sharpening skates for $5 a pair and uh, doing anything we could get by. But we, we kept in touch just, it, it was just in, you know, sporadic emails and letters, or excuse me, phone calls and letters. So you, that leads me right into your mom. Suddenly, she's suddenly a single mom, and your dad's in prison, not making a living, and your mom's working two jobs, and I, I've heard she did some pretty remarkable things for you. Do you want to talk about what she did for work and how that factored into what you were doing? Yeah, she, <clears throat> yeah, of course, she was, she was great. She held down two jobs comfortably. She worked at the, the Westminster Ice Palace, the rink there, uh, during the day so that I could skate for free do my school at the rink uh, during the day. And then at night she went to LAX and worked for Cafe Pacific in the lounge there uh, for people before the flights. And that allowed me to be on standby uh, for all my team's flights. We had to leave, the, we had to leave the state every other week to play teams to kind of gain that recognition. So she put in, you know, 14, 15 hour days every day, uh, came home, cooked, slept, went back and did it again. So. Uh, she was remarkable for, for those three years. My parents uh, divorced when I was two and a half and my mom suddenly a single mom has to help support two young kids. My brother was four and I saw my mom work really hard. There, there were a lot of tough moments there where she was worried she wouldn't be able to pay rent. So it definitely had an impact on me. Did that also have an impact on you just watching her work uh, two jobs, 16 hour days sometimes? Yeah, I think uh, I think I learned the hard work uh, aspect through my dad, but I think I worked the dedication, uh, learned the dedication through my mom in, in the grand scheme of things because she just put her nose to the grindstone and did whatever it took to get by. It, it's funny you mentioned rent because we were we were always late, so we were always hanging at home with the lights off when when they came knocking on the door because it, it just always worked out that we were a little bit behind on on when a paycheck would come through for her. So. Um, you know, I know that struggle as well, but uh, yeah, she had a profound effect on me in those years working the way she did. Similarly, uh, my dad has an incredible work ethic. He used to go to work at four in the morning. And one summer I lived with him before college and I was working construction. If uh, I know you're new to Detroit, but if you go to um, Telegraph and 11 Mile, the Weight Watchers World uh, headquarters is there. And I dug ditches one summer um in the you know working for five dollars per hour cash off the books and <laughs> I thought I was really cool I had my shirt off I was this super skinny scrawny kid and I was hanging with I was you know hanging with um the boys and I used to come home and have to hose off my uh mud I would put them on the fence and then I'd uh go back to work I had to be there at seven in the morning but I loved it 
Um, and it's, it's good. It's good hard work. When, one night I uh, was out with friends and I was out very late. I, I was a, a studious kid. I got into no trouble, uh, was, was very much a nerd. And I, I came home one night and it's very late. It's four in the morning, maybe 3.45. And I think I am sneaking in, no issues. And as I go to open the door, it opens for me. <laughs> And my dad is sitting there and, uh, you know, he looks at me, he looks at his watch and he just nodded. We didn't even have a conversation. I went to bed and out the door, he went with his briefcase and uh, he was, he was off to work. Pretty, pretty, uh, pretty funny story, but you're yeah. a product of your parents. And I think oh, that's pretty important. Yeah. A hundred percent. But I can really, I drive right by that, that area. So I'll have to keep an eye out for a ditch that you dug. Yeah. Uh, when you're heading North, it's on the left-hand side. Uh, used to be a I'll really find it. building. Okay. All right. Yeah. Good. I'll snap a picture for you. <laughs> there you go. Uh, all right. Let's talk about hockey now. Uh, you know, I'm a, a crazy hockey fan. Detroit. I mean, hockey is the sport. We'll talk about that in a little while. But you have immense talent at a very young age. When when did someone say, "Man, you are awesome"? I think I, I think I started to learn a little bit more about it my last year in California. So I would have been you know 14 um i i had left there and went to michigan uh, oddly enough in this you know full circle i'm here again now but uh i played for an elite program here to to kind of put myself on the map and when i started playing against the competition the michigan and southern ontario hockey toronto area when i started my first year dominating that at 15 um you know, and, and I think I, it was something like 152 points in, in 56 games. So it was, yeah, I got to a point where I, once I started to, to, you know, put up the, the numbers that I was putting up and, and teams were taking notice of the, the Ontario Hockey League, which is the big main feeder to the NHL, they came knocking, the U.S. national team came knocking, Minnesota or Michigan, you know, the college came knocking. So all these things are kind of happening as, at once to a 15 year old in 10th grade, I was, I was overwhelmed, but that was when I know that, okay, this is, this is an option for me that, that making a career out of this could be a thing. Right. I mean, a lot of kids when they're younger, you ask a six year old, a seven year old, what do you want to be? I want to be a professional football player, hockey player, basketball player. I mean, so few kids make it, but you're 10 years old and your parents are moving you to play hockey basically. So you must, they must have, known something was up it's it's sort of like these kids now they play tennis they go to nick Balateri's uh tennis camp or um img what was was there there must have been some promise when you were 10 or 11. there, there was i mean i was always one of the highest scorers right um but i just didn't know how the i guess the competition how that translated to the rest of the world i i just always figured that the kids in canada were so much better so it took some time for me to learn that on on a national level that you know number one we were just as good as what they were doing up there and if you can be one of the better players here that translates um 15 is where everything changes that's when the game gets much more fast much more physical um when you watch a lot of players and guys that i played with kind of fade when that starts because number one they're scared or number two they can't think the game at the speed and and as things sped up, I got better uh, because it made it easier for me. So uh, I think that's when I started to really, really see the potential in something. And you mentioned you're in Michigan. I think you considered University of Michigan at one point, best university on, in the history of the planet. Uh, obviously, I went there and they had a most famous coach in collegiate hockey, Red Berenson, where you're trying to play for Red. Yep. I, I did. Michi Michigan was my dream school. Uh, so when they offered me in 10th grade, I, you know, nothing formal about it, but hey, you're coming here when you're ready. Yes, I'll be there. So we had a deal in place and uh, I reneged on the deal because I went to Canada, but uh, I just didn't know what was out there for me. At, at that point, I knew that I wanted to go to Michigan. Here it was. And I said, yes. And uh, I, I think I royally pissed Mel off <laughs> and, or excuse me, read off uh, a couple years later. But uh, it just wasn't my journey. It wasn't my path. I had to. I had to find what was right for me, and I thought that was going up to Canada. And Bobby Clark, a Hall of Famer for the Philadelphia Flyers, had been a friend of your dad's and was a mentor of yours. 
advise you to go play in Ontario? Yeah, Bobby Clark was just, uh, you know, he, he still is very close with my dad. Um, still somebody that I can text if I need it. Uh, you know, Hall, Hall of Fame player, Hall of Fame general manager, um, but all around just a good good human being that's always been in my family's corner. Uh, sat me down and didn't really ask me, just said, you're going to Canada. And uh, uh, this is where you need to be because you're, you know, you're a, you're a lottery pick, you're a top 10 pick. You just don't know it yet. So he really put Canada hockey on the map for me. And, uh, and, and then I started to really look at it. And that was where I ultimately, you know, took myself to. Ontario Hockey League. I grew up in Detroit. Drinking age is 21. Um, Ontario, it was 19. So we used to drive across the border beneath the, the tunnel. I don't know if you've been over again over the tunnel or you take uh, the Ambassador Bridge. And we used to go to the bars there, had fake IDs. Back in the day, you couldn't buy them uh, online with actual barcodes. You took a colored pencil and you try to change the date. But I spent many, <laughs> many, many times in Ontario, had some very interesting moments there. Uh, had you been there before? What did you yep. think? What did you think of Ontario? Uh, so the first time I went was after I got drafted and, uh, I, I had been to Toronto. That's it, right? The GTA area. So um, you have to understand, I got drafted to that league, but I got drafted to a team nobody wanted to go to. Um, it was really up north called Owen Sound uh, on the Georgian Bay, beyond cold. Um, when I got there and the team the team kind of rolled out the red carpet and, you know, had, had a weekend of, I guess, ad adoration poured on me to, to kind of impress me enough to go there. And uh, it, when I left, I still didn't know if that's where I was going to go. But it, over time, it kind of wore on me. And uh, it was a very small town feeling. And I, I had trouble with large groups and large gatherings, uh, you know, probably related to some of the other things I had gone through. So that small town feel immediately just hit me and thought, this is where I need to be. And uh, Still didn't like Canada very much, but it grew on me over time. 39 points your first season, 89 your second season, and you're 18 years old now. And then, uh, boom, second pick in the 2005 draft by the Ducks. I think Sidney Crosby was first that year. What what was that whole thing like? Did you know where you were yeah. going? Where were you just must have been your, your wildest dreams have now come true or they were about to come true? They were getting there. Yeah, I was getting close. Um, I knew the night before that Anaheim was going to take me. Um, so I was able to sleep okay. But um, that process is tough that you're, you're, especially in our year, where it was a lockout in the NHL. So nobody knew where anybody was drafting until a week beforehand. So as opposed to when you're a top 10 pick, you might interview with the top 12 teams, but now you're interviewing with 31. And, uh, and it was a nightmare. You're just, you, you're, you're on the phone all day, you're doing this and that. And there was no video conferencing then. <laughs> so it was um, a lot of times I would leave a hotel room with, I'll just say the Boston Bruins and then go to the next hotel room with the Columbus Blue Jackets and so on and so on. And you're doing it all day long. Um, I was just happy to get that part of it over with. But uh, yeah, it was, it, it was a dream come true weekend. I got to spend it with my family and my dad, my dad, wasn't allowed in the country, but found a way to the draft in Ottawa and uh, <laughs> had to do house arrest after the fact. But uh, it felt like a culmination of a lot of things. What kind of questions do they ask you? I, you hear about football now, you go in, there's all kinds of psychological <coughs> stress. Uh, you're, you're 18 years old. How many people are in the room? I, and who, who's in the room? And what are the questions? I think generally you always have the general manager. Um, and, and his staff, so assistant GM, three or four scouts. Uh, some rooms are just that that small, right? And they keep it very internal. But you would walk in the other rooms, and there'd be 22 guys at a table, and you're supposed to go around and shake their hands and then remember them. And I'm like, guys, I've met 200 people today. Like, I have no clue who you are. Um, I remember I, I didn't know at certain points which team I was talking to. It just it didn't matter because the same questions come across. Um, what do you think you need to get better at? Why should we draft you? Um, what are your weaknesses? What kind of food do you eat? Do you diet? Do you date? Do you drink, smoke? All these things. Just 
and it's just so monotonous that you're doing it over and over again. Um, and I, I know for a fact that I blew some of them towards the end because I, I could have cared less. <laughs> I honestly was like, I, I don't know where you're drafting, but it, it doesn't matter to me. I've done this 18 times today and I'm done. Obviously, you impressed the Ducks. And at this point, you saw a therapist, I think, for the first time. Why did you finally decide to go to one? And, and were you still excited to play at that point? No. So after I got drafted, um, like I said, it felt like a culmination of a lot of things. And I felt like for the first time after all of those years of hiding, running, lying, whatever, the story had come out on ESPN. So that was out there. I felt like, okay, I think I'm done. Like I honestly thought I was done with hockey for a little while. Um, just didn't have the drive or the interest. I, part of me was being spurred on by, by, getting there and not that I had played a game, but I got there, I got drafted. Now I can, you know, now I can uh, relax and I relaxed and my game didn't slip. I got better the next year, um, you know, statistically in every category and things, but um, I just wasn't, my head wasn't in it and it wasn't right. I, I had a lot of things weighing on my mind, uh, you know, conversations I felt like I needed to have. So I, I seeked out, well, actually I didn't seek out Brian Burke from the ducks helped me find somebody they use for sports performance and uh, started driving down the her every Monday in, in uh, Toronto, which is about a two and a half hour drive each way. So I would get up in the morning, drive down, meet her, get back for practice every, every Monday. And uh, she helped me find that inner passion again, that I, that I seemed to be lacking for a little while. It just, uh, it, it helped me off the ice, which helped me on the ice. And uh, yeah, I stuck with her for a lot of years. I think it's important to let our listeners and viewers know there's a stigma against going to therapy. And I've seen a therapist for a long time. I started seeing one as a child, um, was a bullied as a child. And I've had, we all go through some struggles in life. I've gone through my fair share. When I got a divorce, uh, my best friend said to me, first thing you need to do is you gotta find a therapist. And you have to go in and say to the therapist, don't tell me all the shit that happened when I was 10 years old. I need to get through my divorce now. and he was right. And I'm still yeah. with the same uh, a therapist who is my coach, basically my coach in life. I go in there, I bear my soul to her, talk about all the stupid shit I did and all the bad things <laughs> I've done. And these are all my problems. And we work through the problems and she really has moved my needle in a good way. I always yeah. want to be a better person. So I've talked to so many of my friends. No, I don't want to go to therapy. I'm embarrassed. It's not right. And uh, that's how I grew up. People didn't talk about it. Of course, yeah. I live in Los Angeles now, and you're a minority if you do, if you don't have a therapist. <laughs> yeah. That's very true, and that's uh, you know, especially for me in the hockey world, this was 2006, right? Nobody, and and the conversations changed dramatically, but nobody, like a few people, might have gone to sports psychologists, but like real actual therapy, you felt awful for using that as a tool. Um, so I I hid it that I went and. Um, for the longest time and then I stopped going because I didn't feel like I needed it anymore, which I know now that I needed it more than ever. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm glad that the conversation around mental health has changed quite a bit and the NHL is always going to be a little bit behind, but, uh, but they're starting to embrace it a little more. Right. Now you're back at the game. You have a good sports psychologist in 2007, you finally play your first game. Where were you and what happened? Uh, London, England was my first NHL game uh, as part of the Premier Series. So we were playing the Kings for two games over there. And uh, first game was my first goal. Uh, so I got that out of the way and uh, and really had a, I had a good first two games over there. Um, my, my original stint with the team wasn't very long. I was up and down through the minor leagues that first year quite a bit. But uh, it was a good start to a professional career back in 07, yeah. What are you thinking? You're you're on a bus, I assume, from the hotel. You're going to the O2 um, Arena, one of the most awesome places to play a sport or see a concert. Was your heart beating a million miles a minute as you're lacing up your skates and you're coming out of the tunnel and your foot hits the ice for the first time? I mean, what what was all that like? I'm, honestly, I'm glad I got to play it over there because there was no big 
the people didn't know who to root for. <laughs> they were just excited that they were watching hockey. So there was nobody cheering for us or them per se. I got to play my first two games in a relatively easy setting. Um, I thought I'd be more nervous than I was. I remember looking back thinking I just felt like I belonged there at this point, um, that I had earned it through training camp and special teams and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I was at ease going into those two games. And then you're, you said you're back and forth uh, to the minors for a couple of years. You, you had been the, with the sound attack, and now we're, you're with the um, Iowa Chops. What, what's up with these names, by the way? What, where, where are these <laughs> junior names coming from? <laughs> Iowa Chops. I was actually, yeah, the, well, the, the Chops were my second year pro. So my first year pro, I was back and forth between Portland, Maine, and Anaheim um, with the Portland Pirates. And I think I did it like eight times that year. It was ridiculous. So get called up and you're on a red eye out to California and you're playing that night, get sent down and you're on a red eye back to Boston and up to Portland playing that night. Uh, that was the hardest year logistically for me, but I was young and my body could kind of handle it. Um, but it was, it was an up and down year. And then the second year, you know, I made the team out of training camp, but salary cap issues were, were a thing. So I had to get sent down to Iowa chops. And uh, I think I ended up playing 12 games there and they, somebody got hurt on the big club and had to go on long-term reserve for their injury. And that allowed them to call me back up and, uh, haven't been back down since that was in 08. And, uh, yeah, that was, that kind of took off for me that year. And then you had a first hat trick in 2009. <laughs> Things were really picking yeah. out for you then. What, what was that like? I mean, you, you, you hit one, you hit two, and now, you know, you're on the verge of a third. You're, you're just gunning for it at that point. That was, uh, it was incredible. So the funny story about that was that, that was 12 years ago now. Um, and I, I know that because uh, the night before that, I went on my first date ever with my wife and uh, she had never seen a hockey game. So she said, I'll watch it. I had a hat trick. So she thought I did that every night. And uh, <laughs> uh, I remember, <laughs> I was like, that was, that was one of those nights that you just, you know, it was kind of like coming out party in the NHL that night. Um, I remember the feeling was just incredible, but it's the NHL is such a forget, forget league that, you know, we were playing 24 hours later and that hat trick didn't matter right in the grand scheme of things. So I think I celebrated it for 20 minutes. Remember texting, you know, my then person I'm dating for one date and said, I don't do that every night, you know, tamper expectations for next game and, uh, um, and moving on. But uh, it was, you know, I've got some incredible pictures of it all these years later. And, and I got the wife, that I was, you know, 12 years later as well. So it was a good weekend for me. Let's talk about the hat trick for, for a second. I've never understood this. So for those of you who don't know, someone scores their third goal, it's called a hat trick. And people in the stands throw their hats on the ice, obviously because they're wearing hats. But these things are 30 bucks a pop and there could be 50 hats on the ice and they're throwing them <laughs> from the rafters. It's like you're taking 30 bucks and you're throwing it onto the ice to celebrate your home team, which is cool. I mean, it's fun to see. But it's there's thousands yeah. of dollars of hats on the ice. Who gets the caps, by the way? Do you get to keep them? I get none. No, no. Uh, there's a couple different things. I, I've seen trashed. I've seen donated. Um, there's a couple buildings that have a wall uh, on the concourse where they pour the hats into. And you can kind of see them pile up over the years. I don't know if that's still a thing. Uh, oddly enough, I don't get to see many concourses of the rinks that we play in, so I don't know what they do, but uh, I never understood it either. I've seen a lot of hat tricks and never once threw a hat. I keep, I keep my money on my head. <laughs> I keep my money on my head as well. Uh, yeah. I do have a bunch of Red Wing hats, uh, by the way. And of course, yeah, bunch, yeah I, I, probably have, I probably have eight hats, uh, you know, a bunch of jerseys. I, I bought this okay. one at a, a charity auction, a championship jersey, got the whole team on the back. Um, okay, so you you kill it your first year you break right the rookie on. rookie uh by the way I, I i love one of your jerseys but but we can ask uh, you know we can talk about that at some other time uh so so you break the deal rookie. we'll get there <laughs> all right awesome awesome you you break the franchise rookie point record and you're a finalist for rookie of the year the calder memorial trophy are, are you sitting there thinking I'm really proud of myself at the end of the, at the end of the season. Are you at some point you must have to sit back and think I, I've had a really good year. I'm, I'm doing pretty well. You know, I, I decided that I was going to move to California full time at that point. So I had bought a house in Newport beach. Um, 
I, I needed the money from the, the rookie bonuses to be able to do that. So I was like watching as that money came in. I was like, thankfully I can, I can breathe a little bit, not only financially, but security. I know that I'm going to make the team next year. Um, yeah, I took a deep breath for a little bit, but uh, at that point I was just 21 turning 22. I was still hungry. I still wanted to get back to work right away. Um, and, and really didn't take much time off, really just hopped right back in the training that summer to continue it. And, uh, you know, we had a good couple of years together there in Anaheim. We, we, I think we should have won one cup, but your team in Detroit knocked us out in game seven of the semifinals. And that was it for us. So you finish your second year and then the Ducks say, all right, time for the big money. And you get a very big contract, your 23, five-year deal, $25 million. That's a, a ton of money, let alone for a 23-year-old. We're going to come back to money a little later on, but what was the first thing you did when you got that contract? Yeah, I didn't spend very much. I, I waited a while. Um, I waited till the second year of my deal where I was a little more financially secure to buy my dream car, um, which was a Bentley, and I did that. And uh, drove it drove it for six years um, and eventually resold it. But uh, nothing extravagant. I paid off the rest of the house and then bought my dream car, and that was it. I used to go to the Porsche a dealership a couple times a year when I had no money. I'd sit in a 911 and said, one day I want to want to buy one. Our company went public and I thought, okay, it's time now I can buy a Porsche. And I waited a full year before I bought the Porsche. I felt very, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I bought a, I have a 1990, 996 uh, convertible. Uh, 911. And I remember yeah. it was $107,000 okay. without tax. I thought, oh my gosh, that's, that's more than some people make in a year or five years or 10 years. I felt guilty yeah. buying it. Uh, and I still have it. Um, it's in my garage. I'm going to keep it probably forever. It's expensive now to maintain. It costs around $5,000 a year. And uh, Charlie, who, who you know, my son who's 16, said, you can never sell that car, dad. And yeah, you know, awesome. it, it's a it's a symbol for me of my hard work, right? Yeah. I, I worked so hard and I had so many ups and downs and I made some money and I uh, bought my car. Funny, funny thing about that car, I had the car for a day and I figure, okay, I'm gonna wash my car. So it's a nice day, it's hot outside. I've got the bucket, I fill it up, the water, I filled it up with way too much water and the bucket slipped and the corner of the bucket clipped the back of the car and scratched the car one day. One yeah. one day, never fixed it. It's it's just you know, is what it yeah. is. It's a very it's authentic there. car. It's there. It's there. It is what it is. But yeah, I waited a year, and I I still felt guilty when I bought it for sure. And uh, uh, I don't know if I ever really appreciated it when I had it. If I'm being honest, why why not? Just it's your dream car. You have yeah, it. I, there was just uh, I felt guilty driving it. I like every time I would like if I if I just clip somebody, it's a, it's a $30,000 boo-boo. So I, I drove it like a baby. And, uh, um, I think it gave me more anxiety than enjoyment. Were you worried about the perception of how you look? You're 24 years old. You're driving a Bentley around LA. No, because I figured everybody just thought I was a trust fund kid. Like most of the people in LA <laughs> seem to be. So, um, you know, I, I remember some people give me that look and, and I, I was like, I just wish I could tell people I did it my own, right? Like, it, you know, I, I got this on my own, but uh, I got over that uh, a little bit. Yeah, there was always those stairs for sure. In sports, there's always these really unique moments. You're watching a sports center and Scott Van Pelt or someone will say something. This is incredible what happened to you. You're never going to see this again. And you were in a game against the Minnesota Wild one one year. And what happened in that Minnesota Wild game? Yeah, I scored one of the, the I think, probably the craziest goals in NHL history. Uh, I scored on a one-timer, shooting my original way with a left-handed stick on their backhand. Um, crazy play where the sticks got all mixed up and their, their players stole mine, so I found it on the ground. Um, and just happened to pick the stick up and the puck came to me with, with a wide open net and pure reaction. I just took a one timer with a, you know, shooting my normal way with a stick that was facing backwards. Um, 
and then got cocky and held it up like this for everybody to see. So uh, certainly not. I remember they tried to they tried to uh, rebuke the goal and say, you know, you can't do that. But the guy that was doing it was their captain, and he had already stolen my stick. So it was either you give up the goal or you're going to the penalty box. What do you want? And they just eventually let the goal stand. But it was it was a weird one. For those of you who haven't seen it, I encourage you to watch it. It's on YouTube. Uh, it, it's, it's phenomenal. 2013, you've been <laughs> in Southern California for a while, and now it's time to go. You go to um, Ottawa. You're playing for the Senators. Did you know the trade was coming? We knew it was a possibility because of the financial situation and the fact that my statistics were going to were going to require an upgrade uh, financially from them in two years. So being young um, and really a chance for them to kind of capitalize on my value, they they moved me out uh, with two years left on my five year contract. And, uh, that you know that was disappointing. Uh, I, I felt like we had some some work to finish there that that we didn't get a chance to do. But uh, you know you enter the business side of hockey, and that's how things go. So you had a good year there, and then boom, it happened again. You get another massive contract. This one, seven year, fifty million dollars. And by the way, where I grew up, people didn't talk about money. No one knew what people made. Uh, people were humble for the most part. It was something you didn't talk about. But you're a professional athlete, and everybody knows how much you're you you make. I, it's a little weird. It has to be a little uncomfortable, right? People are counting your money, essentially. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. It it it's definitely a weird scenario. People know what you've made to date, right, or what you've made on any given day, and they break it down by period and second, and minute, and hour, and uh, it's a little, it can be a little disconcerting, especially if we, I I didn't have the best of my career was not in Ottawa. Um, so when you go through slumps and ups and downs um, in a Canadian market, and you're making you know seven. 7.2 i don't even know what it was 7.2 a year uh you know the labels come with that so it, it's a little disconcerting and it gets old pretty quick but uh you know it's it's a very small problem to have when you're making that kind of money you don't really get you don't get to have reservations about it when you make that kind of money i don't i don't believe anyway you'd rather make more money than less money obviously and <laughs> you're you know it, it's, it's very it's, much isn't it's like people are always like how do you feel people always ask me they're like you're overpaid i'm like isn't that the goal <laughs> isn't that isn't that what you're trying to do uh, essentially would i rather be underpaid no you know you've earned it right it people take it. a risk right some athletes uh have low salaries they do they do well and um you never know how you're gonna do but uh i'm your friend i think you earned it and i'm glad you got yeah. it so uh too bad for everybody. <laughs> Thanks, else. Thank too, you. Too bad for everybody else. Uh, I I had a <laughs> yeah, lot of criticism. Uh, you know, I, I guess yeah. I I came from the financial world. Um, worked at a big company and managed to make a lot of money as a young person. There there weren't that many people who were happy for me. Frankly, there's a lot of envy and chatter behind the scenes. I've I've lived it. Not like you have that publicly, but certainly within my community my, my yeah. true friends super happy for me and then you know there are some people not not so happy for you but um i'm happy it's, for you yeah it's in every walk of life they you get that right so it's just a matter of what you surround yourself with is what i've learned in the last little while no no doubt you you make your first all-star game in 2015 in quebec how did that feel was was that on the bucket list at some point I wouldn't say it's on the bucket list. No, um, I guess to be an all-star is a, a feather in the cap, right? It's it's something that you have, and you get the jersey and the photo op. But uh, um, you know, it really just I I think most players would tell you they'd rather the four days off to relax and recharge their body for the second half of hockey because it's a grind. The all-star game is a grind. You're there for four days, and it's all media and uh, obligations. And, uh, yeah, I went to one and I was like, I don't, I don't need to go to a second, but, uh, it is a nice feather in the cap. You're one game away at some point from going to the Stanley cup. What, what kind of a dream is it for you to win the cup? Uh, wings are clearly in rebuilding mode, but, yeah. um, what, where is that in your 
goals in life? I think if you asked me when I was 20, it would have been the number one thing and uh, it would have been, you know, all consuming for me. Um, as you get older and I realize I don't know how much time left is in my career. It, I'm, I'm getting older and I'm injured and things like that. Uh, now I'm a dad and a husband. You're, you're, I think your priorities shift. Um, you know, when I go to the rink, it's still my hunger to go to the rink for the cup. Um, but I think there's a little bit less there for me than there would have been even five years ago before kids. Um, but it's, it's still, it's still something that I'm trying to chase actively for sure. Now I want to get to some of the struggles in particular, the addiction to alcohol. Um, it's a problem that affects over 15 million people in the United States. Only 10% of it is actually treated. I think that's one of the, the hopes from this podcast. People will listen to it. It will encourage them to seek help because many people do need to seek help. What, what happened last year? You recognized you had a problem. I think you were in Detroit when this happened. And yeah. what had led up to this? And then walk us, walk us through this. Yeah. Uh, so... I, I mean, you know, personally, I was struggling with it for a while and uh, I just just couldn't get a handle. I would get 20 days of sobriety, doing great, you know, feeling good about myself. And then I would just kind of have that day that you just can't get back. Uh, it was like a binge, uh, binge day. And then I've always had a crippling fear of hangover. So to get rid of that, I would whitewash it and, um, and, and just couldn't, I guess, get ahead of it. Um, and we were here in Detroit, the guys went out, I went out with the guys and had drinks and uh, just woke up in the morning. And I think there was a hangover, but there was also this like this crippling anxiety that was like, I just can't keep going like this. Um, there's, there's no good end in sight for the way I'm living my life, right? Just professionally, more personally than professionally for me at this point, um, I, I could have given give or take the hockey, I just, didn't want to keep letting my wife and kids down. So I, I had all this thing brewing in me for a while. And then I finally hit my peak and said, it's time. Like it's, it's time. So I called my wife from here. Uh, she was in Ottawa and just said, Hey, I, I don't know what's going on, but I'm, I'm leaving. Like I'm getting on a plane and I don't even know where I'm going. I'm just going to wherever they can get me in, uh, to a rehab. So I went for 30 days, uh, to Malibu out by you as well. And, um, you know, we talked about it a few times, but it was the best thing I've ever done. It was, you know, you were, I know you reached out and the support was incredible. Um, I should never really even thank you. So thank you for that, for, for, you know, reaching out and, and, you know, it was, I, I, I know I could have called you to say, Hey, come grab me for dinner or whatever it might have been, but, uh, and I know you would have done it. So I appreciate that, but it was just 30 days of clearing my head, learning about myself and learning that, um, you know, all these, all these emotional problems that I have, which, and I'm not good in a lot of settings, uh, emotionally, with being vulnerable, with, with being upfront with my wife, whatever, I, I've got a ton of them. There's some PTSD, there's, as I started to check out those boxes, um, I realized that alcohol is just, just a, a crutch to get away from treating these things. Uh, so I left there in, in December of last year and uh, got, you know, finished the hockey season sober, uh, went through the summer as best as I could and COVID kind of changed it and kind of put me in a bubble. So it's made it easy. Uh, now, once the hockey season starts back up, I'll get to put it all on the practice. But I, I'm excited about it. It's been a it's been a hell of a ride the last year, uh, with ups and downs. But finally, in a place where I feel equipped to handle whatever comes my way. I I I mean, it's amazing. Um, and I want to go back though and talk about some of the details. When when did you start drinking? And when a lot of people when they're teenagers they drink socially. You go out with your buds. Uh, I drank socially in yeah. college or plenty of times in college. I drank too much and woke up with a hangover. Um, and that was fun. And I think that's at some point normal, not that I condone it, but yeah, you know, you're on the road, you're living with random families playing in, uh, different cities. When, when did you actually have your first drink and then how did it progress? I'm guessing 15 or 16, uh, sometime in junior hockey in Canada was probably the first time I ever drank. Um, and in hockey, it's, it's a big part of the culture. You're having beers with the guys after, 
a win, being on the bus late night, whatever it might be, just hanging out. And, uh, you know, I always kind of partook in that. I would always have beers with the guys, go out. Um, as you get to the next level in the NHL, it's, it's a little more rare that you get a night out as a team. But I was always a guy that went for those and, you know, kind of went to the rink the next day to sweat it out and do what we all do. Uh, but it wasn't until later that uh, I think my mom died in 2016 when, when it just became more of a regular occurrence for me to, uh, to, to kind of just bury myself in that as opposed to dealing with any kind of fallout or residual feelings I was having from that. Um, looking back on it now, my, my wife said that when Riley, was, my, my oldest daughter was born, and my mom died within a couple of weeks of each other. She's like, that's for me, the defining moment when you started to, to have an issue. So 2016 to 2019 was my big, I guess, window of, of really being dependent on it. How often did you drink? I know, obviously, summer you're not playing, but during the year, you said it's, it's hard to go out every night. Would you drink alone or would you only drink when you were out with your team or your buddies? Uh, yeah, I would, I would drink alone, but never like, ne never to obscene amounts, but I'd be at home with my wife or whatever. And we'd have a bottle of wine with dinner and that was it. Um, so I wasn't your everyday average drunk that, you know, left the rink, got drunk, did a rinse and repeat kind of thing. Um, my big, and I, and I, I was always okay with having two glasses of wine and calling it in the evening, but I always wanted more. Uh, I just knew that I had to perform the next day. But, you know, every every other day I'd have wine with my wife at home or whatever it might be. And then I'd go out on the road with the guys and those were my blowouts. But um, it was getting to the point where, like, I was thinking about getting to five o'clock, dumping wine. Um, or we were opening a second bottle and Danielle wouldn't have a glass and it'd be gone. So it was just like I, all these little tiny minuscule details were piling up and the signs were there. I just wasn't recognizing them. Um, and she was. but she wasn't getting through to me either so I was kind of lost in my own little my world at this point did some of your friends try to help you I mean you and I were playing golf a few times and you know we would hang out at lunch dinner you were over at my house a few times uh for dinner and yeah. you you were not sober and <laughs> a couple of times I was very worried about you where you could hardly get the words out and one time during lunch and I I said uh Madison, I said, you know, I, I, I think he has a problem and he's my friend. And do I go to him? Is he going to get mad? Is he going to be insulted? Is he going to say, who the fuck are you? Uh, yeah. Because I, I had dated a girl two and a half years. We were three months into it when I realized she had a serious problem. We were at a wedding in Mexico and she made just the most embarrassing scene out of herself. She embarrassed herself me and we got back to the room and I said this is just not okay and I noticed some things before but she had um, hit it for me we we dated two and a half years and I encouraged her to get help she had been to rehab before a couple of times me and it, it was hard on me and you know you always wonder are you yeah are you gonna push someone and, and what I learned I've been to 50 um, AA meetings with her I've been to um, Elanon meetings and you know it affects the people around you and it's a, it's really a hard thing to go to people who you care about and you know you and I are good friends yeah. but but it's still just a very hard thing you know I I was afraid to come to you even though I thought you know there was an issue I think now if somebody had said something looking back I don't think I would have been receptive to it I think I had to I think when you when you learn it you have to learn it on your time and on your own, like something has to click here. Um, and what I learned was like, even, you know, the person I love the most, when she mentioned it, it still didn't click for me when it was coming from her. So uh, for me, I don't know why it clicked on that day that it did a year ago, um, but it did and it, and it rang true and it's, it's drastically changed my life, but it's, yeah, I don't, I think people need to come to their own realization. They can get, you can get help getting there. Um, but until you feel it for yourself, I don't think there's, it, you have to have a rock bottom to get there, to understand it, I guess. And uh, 
I was lucky enough that my rock bottom was pretty high. I didn't, you know, I didn't burn any bridges on my way down. I didn't lose my money in my house. I didn't drive drunk. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I knew for a while I just couldn't get myself over that hurdle of getting to getting help. Right. And it's it, and you're right. It is harder on the people around you because I watched her go through it for six months before I went. Right. I think one of the other things I hope people take from this uh, podcast is that. There's a lot of people out there who do need help and don't get, uh, don't get help. Uh, the first meeting I went to with her, there were 25 people there and I walk into the room and I recognize five people, people from my com community, yeah. parents at school, very high performers, multimillionaires in the hedge fund world. And I'm looking around the room and this is the reality for a lot of people. They have a lot of problems and I, I, I do know many people who have a drinking problem who just should be getting help and um, you know, don't get help. The, the final straw for me, my girlfriend would often drive drunk. I mean, she was a mess. She would drink a few days a week and it was just a bad situation between us. I had three young kids. I was divorced. She had young kids the same age as mine and I would go out trying to find her in the middle of the night. I couldn't find her. She would call drunk, you know, hang up on uh, me and that night before, and, and I was uh, depressed. It, it was just yeah. so difficult on me. I thought I could save her. And, you know, you talk about in these meetings, you have the master of the universe syndrome. You can, <laughs> you fix anything. And like you said, you, you can't, it has to come, has to come from you. But the, the final straw for me was, uh, my daughters were graduating, uh, kindergarten the next day and two in the morning, she went out and hit a pole on sunset and her fancy car was wrecked into a tree. Thankfully she didn't uh, hurt herself. And that was it. I'm, I'm done. I just can't yeah. do it anymore. And it's, uh, you know, the, the friends that I have who've been through the program have all said uh, they go to regular meetings and you really have to hit rock bottom. You have to want to help yourself. Your loved ones can't help you and can't do it for you. Yeah. No, you have you have to want to you have to have a desire to 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 change things because if you don't, you're going half haphazardly and you're not you're not doing yourself any benefit. You're not doing the people around you any benefit. And um, you know, I'm I'm admittedly not a meeting guy. Um, I I find and and for me, um, going to meetings actually fuels my desire to drink or my anxiety that leads to drinking. Um, I feel like when people people go to meetings to unload right to to what's bothering them that day or that week and they want to unload that so it's off their chest and they cannot deal with it i feel like i was taking those things on um and then i was worrying about people that i didn't know from meetings that uh you know had no business affecting me really but they would so um you know i i work my my sobriety a different way through through therapy and and reading and and podcasts and all sorts of things um but what I've learned in, in my year is that just what works for A might not work for B and, and there's no scale of alcoholism. There's, there's, you, you have an issue or you don't. Um, and, and even if you're a person that, um, I've been to a meeting with a lady that had one glass of wine every single night for 50 years, but it took all of her all day long to get to that one glass. And then she would save her that glass for an hour and then do it. And then she said, I know I'm an alcoholic because as soon as that glass was done, I would start to think about the next one. And um, I think you learn how not to be judgmental because I could think, I could say, okay, well, how is that any different? Or I'm so much worse than you because I drink 15 glasses of whatever it might be. Um, that that uh, no matter how big or small, it's, it's still an issue and it's still somebody's journey. So I, I learned that the meetings aren't going to be my way, but, uh, but I tackle it differently than, than, you know, Joe Blow and, and I, I'm there to support him in his, his journey as much as I can, but, you know, got to find what works for you. What was rehab like? I think a lot of people really don't know what rehab is like. You get there and what happens? What's, what's the program? <coughs> I learned from her, there are various treatment programs. Some uh, facilities run this way, some run the other way. Um, what, what's it like? They go in, do you, do they take your phone? Are you allowed to do certain things? Are you allowed to leave? 
you know, there's a 72 a 72 day or 72 hour, excuse me, isolation period. So no phone. They took my passport. Um, so I was left with my clothes on my back and in my suitcase, which wasn't much because I left from a road trip. So um, I had a, I had arguably the Ritz Carlton of rehabs. It was a beautiful facility, very small. Um, you're in a house with six other people and you're, you, I mean, you're getting what you pay for. Um, or what the NHL paid for for me. So my dues finally came in handy, but uh, it's great for me. It was just, you know, you get to go out and you go to the gym every day. Um, if I had brought my hockey gear, I could have skated every day. There's there's different concessions for different ways of life. And uh, the NHL was great about getting me to this place. Um, but you, but yeah, after 72 hours, you, you have full access to phones and tablets or whatever it might be. But, you know, for me, I was like, okay, I'm here to work. Uh, so I attended all the meetings, the lectures, there's a lot of them. You're every other hour you're doing something. And when you're not doing something, you're kind of journaling or trying to figure out what works for you to, I guess, best sponge what's coming your way. Um, so in 30 days, you kind of got to develop a program for yourself. That's going to work for you outside the walls. And, uh, I got very lucky in the sense of the place that I was gave me those, those tools. Because I, I learned very quickly that I'm not going to be a meeting guy, but I'm going to be a therapy guy probably for the rest of my life. And are you doing therapy now? Yeah, yeah, it's been the best thing I've ever done. I, I left there and went right back to Ottawa, was home for Christmas and met my, my you know, new therapist there. Uh, she's from Ottawa, so we're on Zoom now that I'm traded, but uh, I'm going to continue with her until she feels like I can make a transition to somebody else that's going to be local. But uh yeah it's cognitive behavioral therapy cbt as it's called and um by far the the best thing i've ever done is is learn how to deal with alcohol through that really how much healthier is it mentally now that you don't have kind of the physical hangover from the drinking i mean your your bloodstream is clean your head must be a lot cleaner what what yeah what does that feel like I, I feel incredible. Um, it's nice not to the physical side of my body has never felt better. I feel like I'm younger on the ice, more powerful than I have been in years. Um, but those, those are far secondary to like the mental uh, acuity, I guess, that I, that I've gotten back to clarity. There's no fog. There's no waking up and asking or thinking about what, what conversation did I have with my wife last night? Um, you know, did I check that box? Did I do this or that? Um, if I, you know, if I said something wrong, if I, if I forgot to do something, whatever it might be, the, the things that you just don't do when you're in a state of a couple glasses of wine. Um, so I got rid of all those things and, and the mental side of my life just changed dramatically. I'm closer with my kids. I'm able to tolerate more. My short fuse is getting longer. It's still short, but it's getting longer. So uh, all the benefits far outweigh, you know, being, being a drunk. You're doing great. You came back. And one of uh, the great moments of the year, uh, first game, what happened? My first game back at, at home, I had a hat trick. I had a hat trick again. So it, I think it had been five five years since my last hat trick, and it was on the hundred and first day of being sober. Um, you know, really kind of the uh, the best part of the last year, that's for sure. All the journey and to come out and have a hat trick is. It was just incredible, right? I only had one goal all year leading up to that and to have three the night you're back in front of your home fans and the building erupts. Just just a magical evening. And the fans love you again. What a what a story of redemption. What what were you what were you feeling that first game back? Could you wait to get back to the ice? I mean, when when I talked to you a couple of times, you know, we were texting, you know, for a couple of months. You you were kind of this limbo, you were waiting to get back, waiting for the league to let you back and then then you're back what was it like first step on the ice i can't remember i don't remember being that nervous for a game in a very long time um i think i was more nervous to impress my wife again right to have that feeling again and and playing in front of her and um you know i, I knew that Ottawa was a very small community even though it's the capital so i knew that they were going to be good to me uh but you know to to kind of reward them for being patient with me through the process i was fed up with everything i was going through at this point i just wanted to play and it felt like there was another hurdle every week that seemed imaginary so i didn't know if i was ever going to play at this point but um 
to get back and be nervous and, and have that excitement to play in the league again and then do that just uh just incredible very emotional night i was yeah i was wrecked i was wrecked for a couple of days uh, i think the next game was just a night two nights later and i was i was exhausted still just physically and emotionally spent right let's talk about detroit my hometown you had been there before the red wings rule the city uh you signed in the off season a one-year one million dollar deal we talked about uh steve eiserman i'm wearing the championship steve eiserman jersey here one of uh he's a hockey legend one of the best players in league history he is a god in detroit uh and the last year he became back to be the wings general manager uh i want to tell a quick uh story for for i think the wings in their history have won eight or nine uh championships um and for a while they were terrible they were called the dead wings and I was a freshman at college. My stepdad had tickets, uh, season tickets, and I took one of my friends. We finally make the playoffs. I'm going to the first game, super pumped, drive from um, Ann Arbor uh, to the Joe. And I've been a Red Wings fan forever. I think my first game, I was in footies at Cobo Hall, which you probably, you know, the new Cobo Hall, <laughs> what the old Cobo Hall is, and then um, Olympia. Actually, we were at um, Olympia first, and then they played at Cobo Hall, and then they built the Joe, which I think they uh, demolished this this year or last year. But I've been a hockey yeah. fan, been been a fan my whole life. So we make the playoffs for the first time. I took my buddy Rick Winkler, who had we had been at a fraternity party the week before, and Rick was in the wrong place at, at the wrong time. The nicest guy ever, and he gets popped in the nose the fight breaks out in the fraternity party and he gets hit not in the fight but he gets hit breaks uh -huh. his nose so we go to the game and he's wearing this huge white mask he's all taped up he's got like <laughs> the plastic over the nose and <laughs> gerard Gallant for the king scores 57 seconds into the game and place went bananas i'm pumping my fist pump my fist yes and i accidentally hit the nose <laughs> And oh, you off, busted him open again. Off comes the mask. <laughs> it's streaming blood everywhere. And uh, and I stayed in my seat. I didn't want to leave. And so uh, he went off. The <laughs> Sorry, man. He, get, he gets off. He goes, gets the tissues, you know, comes back. I said, hey, man, I, I feel really bad, but I want to watch the game. He's like, no, totally cool. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Winks, you're going to hear. Awesome. Winks, I, I, I know you're going to listen to this i know you're gonna watch it on uh i'm sorry about that i love you buddy but uh <laughs> so so okay so uh, steve eiserman is the gm and i read you were his first call how'd that go and uh what's it like to be in the motor city playing hockey all right i'm stoked i can't wait um we settled in nicely my conversation with steve was incredible um I think we both acknowledge, listen, you're getting, you're getting older in the league. Um, but there's still some, there's still some hockey left in you. Uh, come and bring it here, you know, bring that hockey that you got left in you and we'll, and we'll try to maximize it together. One of my friends, Bo Hostler is a PGA tour player. He was the college player of the year. He was up with Madison and I, we flew up. Uh, he was our guest for the weekend and I thought it'd be cool. We got a pro hockey player and a pro golfer. And I just want to be in the middle of a conversation. I mean, I was just fascinated and I knew nothing about golf. First, I have to thank you for tolerating me on the golf course. At one point, I was the worst, I was the worst player at uh, Gazer, where, where we have our homes. But I promise you, I'm coming back with a vengeance. I'm actually taking golf lessons at this place called UGP, um, Urban Golf Performance here. And uh, I'm going to be significantly better this year. And Shout out to Matt Parkovich, my my uh, my instructor and friend and coach. But I'm I'm super excited to play. But thank you for putting up with a guy who loses thirty balls around. <laughs> but uh, not not gonna happen. <laughs> it's all good. Not not going to happen okay. this year. You'll you'll see a much better uh, player. But you know the the cool thing for me that round was he asked you something which which was kind of like a ding 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 moment for you. He said. 
hey, when did you know you were better than the rest of the guys? And you were basically saying to him, you know, you're playing with all these guys who are not going to make it. You can see they're not going to make it, but they can't see they're not going to make it. So what what's that like? You know, you've got teammates, you're better, but, you know, the the margin there is small, but it's huge at the same time. Yeah, I think it's the margin's much more noticeable when you're in it as a player um, than, than what meets the eye. A lot of people will say, this guy's so skilled, he should be there, but skill doesn't necessarily translate. Um, you need to apply that skill at speed. You need to make decisions at speed. You need to you need to be able to apply things to certain situations and you can see when you're on the ice that a guy can't see a play forming or a guy can't um a guy can't make that 10 foot outlet pass that just makes the game much easier on them right they have to skate themselves into trouble those are things that when you're playing with guys you're like okay you know this is about as far as he's going to be able to take this game and that's frustrating because you want especially when your teammates at young age juniors and things like that you want to see guys succeed but at 15, I think you're going to already start to see the game passing guys by. Um, it's upsetting and frustrating, and you want to kind of pull them along, but a lot of guys don't get it. Um, so at a certain point, you got to just kind of – you got to uh, turn your mind out to it because I think I read a stat at .002 or something like that of players that play even AAA hockey make it to this level. So it's, it's a very fine line. I met Luke Robitaille 15 years ago through my friend, uh, Jimmy Carson, and he's going to be a guest on my next podcast. And who was the other player on the other side of the Wayne Gretzky trade? Most people don't know that. He's got a very interesting journey to, you know, to follow yeah. uh, Wayne, which is the actual last person you'd ever want to follow. But I, I met Luke and um, I went to his retirement party which was at the Ritz Carlton and um, Marina Del Rey. And, you know, for me, this was just, I was in hog heaven, you know, Messi is there, all, all these incredible people are there. And Marty McSorley was reading the uh, scouting report for Luke. And he basically said, uh, I think it was like an eighth or a ninth round pick. And it's yeah, uh, late. too small, can't go in the corner, lacks speed and lacks hand-eye coordination. And, and he finished his career as the highest scoring left winger <laughs> in professional history in, in NHL history. Yep. So yep. some guys sometimes, you know, they come out of nowhere, right? And they light it up. Yep. I think that the higher the level, especially to when you when you get guys like Luke, they, he just had an instinct to find the puck around the net. Um, and instinctual things aren't going to be taught. You can develop a little bit, but you can't teach that. I and mean, he had just this perfect doggedness around the net and a way to get his stick on pucks that um that kind of at that time was was a very very big skill to have and uh yeah he made a nice career for himself a hall of fame career and is one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet by the way he yes he is yes he is so Let's talk about professional athletes and money. You, you hear about the football players and a lot of the basketball players. I think 78% of football players are in some kind of financial distress within two years after retiring. I think the average uh, tenure is three and a half years. 60% of NBA players go broke uh, after five years. Large number of uh, baseball players. You made a lot of money as a young person. I mean, early 20s. Who taught you about money? Did someone teach you? I know you're conservative with your money. You've saved a lot of money, which is awesome. But who who gave you that training? I think today things are different as well than they were 15 years ago. I think the league now recognizes, you know, they need to um, educate yeah. their, their guys. But, I mean, it's a lot of money when you're young. What? Talk to me about that. Yeah. When I was coming in, they still didn't have it. They have it now. It's workshops, right? And things like that. And how to how to tell um, you know, who's who's trying to invest your money properly, who's there. Um as opposed to guys just finding somebody from their neighborhood, which is all happens more often than it should. So the NHL's got a, a pretty good protocol in place to to educate some young players on, on how to find somebody to invest which is the biggest part of it right um find somebody that's that's not interested maybe because you're making so much you don't need to hit home runs you just need to continuously hit doubles and singles and uh and and learn how to do those things properly and i've been lucky enough that you know money financially it's never 
money's never played a real big part of my life. I mean, I, I've bought houses and things like that and, and, you know, take my family where they need to be. But, uh, you know, other than the one car, I haven't, I haven't indulged in things like that. Um, I, I lease all my cars and, and just continuously, um, you know, live pretty frugally for myself. But, uh, I've been, I've been fortunate. My dad, my dad was a smart money man, um, found the right people for me, uh, to, to start with when I was 22 and just signing that first contract. And I've been with them ever since. And, uh, I think it's just about developing the right relationship with those people and, and stress and what you want and, and making sure that they're not out there trying to hit home runs that don't need to be hit. Right. That, uh, that you're all on the same page. And, uh, I've been, I've been very lucky. My, my guys have been great. Did the money attract some of the wrong people or were people coming after you or asking for loans? When I made money, I had some very awkward conversations with people with certain family members and, you know, people that were yeah. friends and one of my really good friends, uh, two of my really good friends. Yeah. At the time. It's, it's funny. The more you make, the more people come out of the woodworks and the more, um, the more business opportunities come your way. Um, I, I've never, I don't think I've ever, done any of them that have come my way I've, I've, but the same as you you have to have some awkward conversations and you have to say listen like this is this is money for the rest of my life and i'm going to be done at 33 34 i need this to last and uh i've cut some people out of my life because of it and uh ultimately happier because of it too so uh, i feel like i've just continuously continuously made the right decisions in, in that regard are you planning for your future now, after life, after hockey, uh, you'll probably play a few more years, hopefully, if, if that's what you want to do. But have you started thinking about and planning what's next after hockey? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm starting to plan for the future. Um, I, I don't think I invested enough time in it as I should have. But uh, I, I was fortunate enough to build a pretty good cushion that I can take the time when I'm done to to make decisions about you know what I want to do and how I want to do it. Um, and, and if I want to live comfortably, I can live off the interest and be just fine as well, but, uh, I'll be bored and I'll have to look at something. So we're starting to look at those transitions. They're, they're, they're coming rather quickly. And, uh, I don't think I'll have, I don't, I'll, I won't have an issue leaving the game or, or, you know, doing something dumb financially. I'll be able to, to kind of pick and choose what I want to do. And, uh, and it's not, that's a good feeling to have that, that the people around me have done right by me that I can do that and take my time. Let's talk quickly about playing through pain and injury. I remember you telling me about one game where you got into a fight. I guess when you come to the league, people are going to challenge your, your manlyhood. And you were in this uh, quite a, <clears throat> quite a, a fight. Um, tell me about what that was like and what, what it's like to actually be able to fight legally. It's kind of this weird construct you can go outside the arena and you get arrested but somehow in the arena <laughs> same rules apply but you can fight in there no one gets arrested yeah yeah you got 200 feet by 80 feet to figure out what you want to do uh down on the ice but i've had quite a few um as i've gotten older I've, unfortunately i fought more as i've gotten older um i guess my yeah i'm just getting i'm old and ornery now but uh um, I, I can't remember which one we were, we were probably shooting the shit on some of my earliest ones and I can't remember, but, uh, I've had some broken fingers in fights and teeth been punched out. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. All sorts of different ones in my, I got my eyelids split pretty good. So, um, I, I wish I would, do you remember which one I was talking about in general? Yeah, it, it was, I think you just got really, it was your first game and I, you, you were very young and one of the veteran fighters kind of went after you and knocked you, yeah. you know, pretty good. I, I, you had something broke and you had a concussion and you went out and you played the rest of the game. You didn't even know where you were. It was one of my first fights. And, uh, now I remember which one. I got. So, uh, yeah, I picked the wrong guy and he, and he knocked me around pretty good. And, um, it was the first time I went through concussion protocol. We'll just put it that way. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I wasn't seeing straight for a little while, but, uh, you live and you learn and, and then I kind of realized maybe I shouldn't be fighting legitimate heavyweights in the NHL or legitimate tough guys in the NHL. I'll pick my battles a little better. Right. I think today is a little different. I, I don't think, was there a concussion protocol 15 years ago? I mean, you just, you told me you went out on the ice and, and you played, you didn't even know where you were. 
Oh yeah, that was the thing. The concussion protocol back then was like, "Hey, are you good? Yeah, okay, all right. You know where you are? Yeah, sure. I, I, I know where I'm at, but yeah." And then I remember you just, yeah, you're, I was out of it. Like, I there was no way I should have played. But uh, now it's now it's completely different. What are your interests and hobbies outside of hockey? I think people. You're an athlete people look up to, but I, I don't know that a whole lot of people think about, all right, what does this person do when he's not playing hockey? Yeah. Um, during the season, not much. Uh, it, it's, you know, I, I come home and I'm a parent and then by the time they're in bed, I'm in bed by 8.30 most nights as well. So uh, I'll stream a show or two with my wife and go to bed. Uh, I save most of my reading. I'm a, I'm a pretty voracious reader on the, ra- on the road. Um, right now I'm going through the hundred books every man must read list uh and i just started 1984 last week so i'm getting into that a little bit and uh really enjoying it um during the summer i golf and i surf and um you know before kids i was a six day a week golfer now i'm kind of a two or three day a week golfer but it's better it's more fun for me to be on the boat right now and my, my daughter is going to start surfing next summer so uh, just family time right as you get older that's what becomes more important we're gonna wake surf next summer yeah, I'll be there. Yeah. You got to come down to Black Rock, though. I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming. I've been trying to get me to right. come here to play, but I'm, I'm definitely coming next summer. I, I hear it's, it's awesome. Yeah. We'll be there. I, I'd like to get your thoughts, and I think a lot of people listening, I always want to know from successful people, no matter what they do, what are the ingredients of success to you? What do, what do people have to do to be successful with whatever they do? I, I, so it's funny when, when people ask me that in a hockey setting, it, it doesn't really change in any walk of life, right? I, it, you have to have, yeah, you have to have a militaristic focus on, on not only a task at hand, but it doesn't have to be your end goal. It's just a goal along the way of it. Of a, uh, you know, for my whole life, getting to that end goal, I, I, had little small steps that I needed to make to get there. And every step was a mini success that I celebrated, it, but it's ultimately got me one step closer. So you have to have an approach that, that can get you there slowly and incrementally. Uh, yeah. You have to, you have to be able to outlast anybody that you're going against a competitor. It's, you have to be able to just be 5% more than what they can give you there. If it's a 40 hour work week, you find a way to get 44 in. Like those are those little things that I find that add up over time and they're not noticeable things, right? They're, and they're not, they're not things that get adulation. They're just small little workabout things that can kind of get, get you an edge on people. Um, and then a support structure, um, people to bounce ideas off of, people to to call you on your bullshit when you're wrong, um, you know, and, and um, you know, the people that are ultimately going to be there by your side, whether you fail or, or you succeed, those are things that you need to have. And, uh, and if you don't have that, you have to build something of that regard. And, you know, somebody told me, and somebody that I speak really highly of was um, a member of Gaza Ranch and, and a close friend of mine told me about 10 years ago, he said, in life, there's givers and there's takers. And if you can eliminate the takers and, and surround yourself with people that are giving and, and uh, you're, you're going to be okay in a lot of aspects of your life. And I've tried to apply that in a lot of areas. And, and since I've done it and had some hard conversations in doing it, I've, my quality of life and quality of success has gone through the roof. Uh, so that, that, those, that last one more importantly than anything else. What's the first thing you think about in the morning when you wake up? And what's the last thing you think about when you go to bed? Last thing, well, I guess I could start with that is uh, everything okay upstairs where the kids are. That's I, honestly, as I lay down the bed, I don't have any thoughts outside of those two now. Uh, is the door locked? Is every door locked? Like every fatherly instinct you're supposed to have. Um, the first thing in that in my life changed dramatically is uh, setting a, a intention for the day. Uh, and that's kind of ties in with AA a little bit, but uh, every, every day and I write it in a book and I now I keep a book that I follow every day. I go and I read what my intention of the day is. And I set the attention a few days at a time. Uh, so some days I'll wake up, I'll go read that. And my intention of the day is sometimes just get the day started, <laughs> just get like, just, just get it going. And then other days it's something hockey specific or something wife specific or whatever it might be. Um, but the first thing I think about is how can I 
how can I achieve the attention that I had set? Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's another positive thing if you can get to it and setting intentions. It's uh, it's changed my life a lot. Do you write down your goals for the future? What what are your goals for the future? You're still very young. I write down. Yeah, years I, I I haven't written down life goals or anything. I, I right now it's season by season goals, and those have changed drastically. But uh, yeah, I actually spent about an hour and a half doing it the other night. I wrote down every every goal that I have, whether it be on the ice or off the ice this hockey season. And uh, yep, set 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 the goals, and now I said one little increment to get to each goal. I've had a personal business plan that I keep each year. I check it each year. I have a reminder in my calendar each two months to go through it. And I have various goals. I have personal goals, things I need to work on, family goal, friend goal. And then don't just write it down once. You got to go back and look at it and you got to yeah. treat it like it's actual work because it is work. It's it's <laughs> hard work. It's hard work. Yeah. yeah. My, my wife, finds me exhausting because I have to go back through the book five, six times a day to make sure I'm checking. I, I mean, I write down everything I eat, everything I, every calorie in, every calorie out, but I, I live by that book right now. And that book helps me not only stay sober, keep me accountable in the rest of the, the areas that I need to get better at. So uh, as much as she needles me about it, I think she's pretty happy I have the book. <laughs> That's great. We're almost at the end. I want to know what kind of advice do you have Three to five best pieces for people who are young. I'm not talking about athletes. I'm talking about people in general. You're you're a professional athlete, but you're more importantly a human being, and you've been through so much stuff in your life. Your experiences are so unique. I don't think there's another person in the world, frankly, who's been through what you've been through, uh, for better or for worse, and it's for the better. I think we always learn, and we're better people coming out of hardships. But what what are some of the three what are three to five pieces of advice you would give to younger people or even people of my age uh, who want to do better and improve themselves? You know, for me, I hate dishing out advice when it's not specific to something. But uh, I would learn to control the controllables. Right? There's so many things, especially with the state of the world, the pandemic, COVID, job job security, all those things um, are so beyond a lot of our reach, right? So control, control with controllable, like have, have the things around you that mean the most to you and when you can control those um, and, and let the outside influences do their thing, um, your world will get smaller and it'll get easier to manage. That's something that I've always found. Um, never let any, can you hear me still? Yeah. Just make it sure. Yeah. yeah um, you know, for a second, I would never let any kind of outside voice dictate the way you're going to live your life, whether that's a good inside voice or a good outside voice or a negative or a positive. Um, you know, uh, just don't uh, just don't let them wear you down, I guess, right? Or or don't let them build you up to when you when you do fall, it's going to be a crumble, right? You just got to continue to be on that even keel uh, in those aspects. And then, you know, third, uh, I had something in mind, and I. I that's what I was going to say. Like, I guess it would just be never too high, never too low. It's a sports cliche that I use and it, it sounds like a sports cliche, but it's, it's about, I guess, never, never being above yourself, I guess, never, never, you know, being braggadocious or being, um, you know, too high up in the wave because that way eventually going to crash down and you're going to be in the low end looking up at somebody and, you know, don't, don't go with the wave, try to try and be a Stephen Keel. And I apologize because I'm not as eloquent as I think I am sometimes, but just, just, you know, be, be an even keel, you know, never too high, never too low. That's what I'm saying. Hockey teams up, down, up, down. Like if you go with the wave um, and you get low, you're losing 10, 12 games in a row, no problem. So I was like, if you can kind of keep your head above the water at those times and, and, and stay treading, you're, you're going to be good. That's great advice. In closing, we, we've really covered a lot of things. I want to ask, is there something we haven't covered that you want to talk about or a message you want to share with people who are listening to the podcast? No, I think we've covered a lot. I ultimately I, you know, we talked about the the biggest part of it's the alcoholism and, and addiction, whether it's alcoholism or whatever it might be. I think uh 
you know, I, I, I've done a lot of little interviews and things now, and I try to always urge somebody that um, you don't have to admit you need help, right? You, but what I urge people to do is have the right conversation. Um, if you're thinking it, you're probably, you're probably needing it, right? If you're, if you're starting to think I, I drink too much or I, I have an issue with this, your, your friends probably already think it too, right? So um, I would always urge somebody to talk to the one person you trust the most, admit to them where you're at and go from there. And uh, it doesn't have to be a big thing. It doesn't have to be a little thing. It can be a very small conversation that gets the ball rolling. And that's ultimately what it's all about is getting the ball rolling because life continues to get better when you do. Awesome. Bobby, again, I can't thank you enough for being here, sharing your story. You're an incredible person. You're a great friend. And you're an inspiration to so many people, including me. So thank you so much for being on the show. I'm very grateful. It's my pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for, thanks for rescheduling for me a few times. I appreciate it. But uh, I'm glad we could make it work. And I'm looking forward to it. And I appreciate your friendship, man. It's, it's been a lot to me last year. When you reach out, it really does mean a lot. So continue to do so. And uh, I got your back if you ever need anything as well.